And many researchers claim that this definition of entropy can be extended to an equilibrium state. Remember that this expression is for equilibrium states in thermal equilibrium with environment. Welcome to this second course, the second class of the, the short course on quantum thermodynamics. I'd like to begin by saying something that I forgot to tell you before, in the first class. So, it's about the sign criterion. Imagine I have my system. In physics, it's usually to consider the heat absorbed by a system zero and a uh, positive sorry and negative it is absorbed by environment it's flo flowing out of a system if work is do is done on the system it's usually negative sorry negative and if it's the system the one that performs this work is then positive okay you might find other criteria uh, in different books or even in different fields of study um, in, chemi in chemistry yeah in chemistry they change it uh, I really don't know why but okay they have a different same criterion okay uh, no I like to say that the equations are, I try to, I'm not focusing on the signs, but I think you can put a sign implicitly on your Bible. I mean, you have the first principle in this way. Some other books, you can find it in this way. It depends on where you are putting the minus, the equation or in the W, okay? The important thing is to use the same sign criterion. I like to use this one, but in general, you can use whatever you want. Okay, so let's move on to the second class about the first law of quantum thermodynamics and open system. Okay. Then I'd like to begin recalling the first postulate of quantum mechanics that says that a state of any quantum system is described by a state vector C of a Hilbert space. The thing is that this description is not useful when we are dealing with mixed states. These states are, for example, the state. The state of a bunch of particles belonging to a certain statistical ensemble. Okay, you have a bunch of particles with different temperatures, different energies, and you have them mixed. Okay, you cannot describe this in this way. So, in order to describe the whole system, we define a new operator, the so called density operator or the density matrix. And it's done in this way rho is equal to the sum of some piece of ice and then my state. Okay, this formalism is really useful because you can demonstrate that the average value of the any given observable A is just the trace of rho, my density matrix, times this observable. So it's really easy to perform some calculations. You can all these derivations, you can find them in classical quantum mechanic books or textbooks like Cohen Tanuji or Satilis or whatever. The one you like, you, you might have some introduction to the density matrix and the properties of the density matrix. The thing is, I like to present you this because the temporal evolution of the system, when it's closed, um, it's given by the 
Schrodinger equation, as you may know. I mean, the, you have the state of your system. Okay. But if you want to calculate the analogous with the density matrix, it transforms into the von Neumann equation. This is Schrodinger. This is von Neumann. Von Neumann. It's the analogous. Here, this is the commutator. And as I said, this is really useful when dealing with mixed states or when you have a bunch of particles belonging to certain statistical ensemble or entangled states. It's really, really useful to use this formalism. Okay, so now let's move on. If I, if I can. Let's move on and imagine that we have phase our system described by a Hamiltonian and a density matrix and an Lagrange environment here described as well by its corresponding Hamiltonian and density matrix and the whole system, the total, also is described this way. So, um, we have this, our system interacting with a Hamiltonian, with a environment, sorry. And this will we define an open quantum system. The system S is now is not closed anymore. In this case, the system for the system, the environment doesn't exist. It's isolated. But now we have this interaction between the system and the environment. So the temporal evolution of the total system, which is a closed system, if we consider these two parts, is given by von Neumann. Okay, but we are interested in calculating how is the system evolving. So we perform what we call a partial trace in order to eliminate the environment decrease of freedom. That is, we do something like this. <coughs> Sorry. The, this operation eliminates the degrees of freedom of the environment and we get the state of our system. So in order to study this temporal evolution, we will split the Hamiltonian into three terms. The Hamiltonian of the system plus the Hamiltonian of the environment plus some constant alpha times the Hamiltonian of the interaction. After some calculations and <coughs> assumptions, the general equation obtained after this uh, process, you can find it in Manzano. This paper I presented the first slide, uh, first day, sorry. Uh, the temporal evolution of Tain is the uh, Lindner equation. Okay, calling rho to, to rho of the system is this equation here. You have the first part, which is exactly equal to the von Neumann equation plus some interaction term with this shape. Okay, here, as you might see, this is the four new equation, and this interaction term these are the rates, some rates. <coughs> Sorry. Some constants. 
Um, this also I and also I daga are the limblad jump operators. This and so I model the interaction between the system and the environment, okay? And then this expression here is the anti-commutator. Instead of subtracting one term and another, we sum them. Okay? It's different. So this is the limit equation. They provide you with some examples. A really easy to understand example is imagine you have a two-level system attached to a thermal bar at a given temperature. So the Hamilton of the system is just a two-level system, so it's proportional to the Pauli set matrix and the initial state will be given by the system in the upper state up one zero or up down this is a two level system you can call it what you want so imagine it's in the first integral zero up and, and you want to calculate the temporal evolution of the system so you have Yeah, the probability of being in one state or another. So, the probability of the population, if you wish. It turns out if you solve the, in this case, four new one equation, you can do it numerically if you want. I mean, it's really easy, but for more sophisticated problems, it's really easy, it's really complicated to calculate the limit equation, analytically. So you can use, I use Python and the package Qtip. I mean, this one is really easy, but for more sophisticated ones, you get that uh, the, uh, the probability to find the particle, the, the excitation of the the system in the upper state is equal to 1, always equal to 1, and the one of finding it in 0 is always equal to 0. However, for, without interaction, and now with interaction, the Lindler operators are simply given this case by the power ladder uh, operators and the thing is when we attach thermal bath we find this thing the system evolves And the probability of finding the particle that in a given state is not continuous, it's not um, constant anymore, they begin to vary. So these dynamics, the fact of interacting, the fact of having an interaction term between the system and the environment makes the system change. And you can see it's doing it in this way. So then, um, yeah. Here you have an ex this example to understand how the um, the dynamics of open systems is with Limbla. Okay. Now to conclude, I present you the first law, <coughs> which is uh, the conservation of energy, as in the same way as before, but now with a quantum version. So how is energy in quantum mechanics? with this from my use of density matrices. Then just simply the trace of H times 
the, the main density matrix times h because it's the average value of the Hamiltonian. So calculating the temporal evolution, the temporal derivative, we get two terms. The first one is this one, and the second one is this one, by virtue of the rule of the product of the derivative. So this first term is identified as heat, as warm, sorry. And this one as heat. Why? The thing is, here we have a Hamiltonian, the variation of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian can be varied externally. We can control how we vary the Hamiltonian. For example, with a laser or a driving, we can modify that. So this it has this notion of being controllable and that's related to work. However, we cannot control how is the system varying, how is the state of my system. So that's associated to heat. Okay? This is how we can define this in one way or another. In an integral way, in integral form, we can compute this in the following way. The trace of rho and h dot t dt prime and q t is equal to integral zero t trace rho, rho t prime and h t prime. One of the main problems of this interpretation, it's mathematically correct, but physically eh, we don't have a much insight here because this is just an identification we're making. We are not trying to provide some sort of math physical insight more than that of being controllable or not. I think for some systems you can have a contribution of the variation of Hamiltonian which gives rise to a which gives a a rise of the temperature of the system and that should be identified as heat. Um and vice versa, you can have some variation of your system and then you can consider the as work instead of heat. It's not really a good math physical definition, although it's mathematically correct. So that's the topic in fact of my my research and my thesis is about the concepts of heat and work in quantum thermodynamics. So uh, finally I let you I'd like you to know how are the, the thermal equilibrium states at a given temperature because we called we, we talked about it in the first class. We said that they are given by some sort of equation like this. For example, the ideal gas is the well known PV is equal to NK sub B T. But here they are given by the so-called Gibbs states. Sorry. These states are simple. The exponential minus beta h over the trace. Beta is one over the temperature and set is the partition, the partition function. If you have studied statistical mechanics, you you might know that this is the um, probability density in canonical quantum canonical um, ensemble, and the states of by system at a given temperature are simply given by this. So when we, if I say a thermal equilibrium state in quantum thermodynamics, they will be given by a state like this one. So that will be the beginning of the next class, and we will define how is the entropy of that state.
So should we discuss? Trace of the total density matrix to get the one of the systems, and that since you are kind of lost information, that's what makes the irreversibility appear. But if I think about classical thermodynamics, even if you have a, a, an isolated system, you are losing any information because you're not restricting to any subsystem. If you have irreversibility, like the whole universe uh, can have irreversible processes, the, the normal thing, the entropy usually increases. So mm. that's what I will try to uh, discuss with you. Yes. Um, For today, it's not online. Yes. Um, yeah, but that's interesting, right? Because even in classical systems, in a way, Classical mechanics and quantum mechanics are both reversible. I mean, the mechanics, right? Uh, but those classical thermodynamics and arguably quantum thermodynamics should be non reversible. Uh, don't you think that this is like when you said that when you take a partial trace, I think it's more of a more than a mathematical problem, it's more of a definition of problem or reversibility in particular, right? Because if you just take classical mechanics for the point per second, it's kind of the same question. How do you get irreversibility from in statistical mechanics? Right? Uh, one way to do that is by yeah, by taking parts and like you evolve everything together, but then you only look at one part. You lose information in you know, looking at one part. So I guess yeah, my question to the speaker that was not here unfortunately would be. How how those two things fit? Right? Because yeah, it seems that it's analogous. Right? It should be analogous. It should be analogous. In like what sense is quantum quantum thermodynamics any different from classical thermodynamics in that sense? Otherwise, we can just uh, close the session and have a longer lunch break. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Silvia, Diego, Vicente. We've seen you uh, many days, so we feel your presence. <laughs> uh, I wish we were here with us and you can come to the dinner tonight and to, the, to lunch together. But otherwise, we'll resume at three o'clock with the final session and I'll do a little closing there. So, see you later. Thank you.